Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, we come now in the name of Jesus. Again, we come asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to St. John's Gospel, the 17th chapter, and uh, look at a verse that you're all familiar with, and uh, we'll trust that Jesus will help us with it some way. St. John's Gospel, 17th chapter, and uh, the 17th verse. Jesus is speaking. He said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Many years in evangelistic work, I used to preach on sanctification, but I never would use the word because it so many times turned people off. So I'd try to preach on it without using the word, hoping they'd have a hunger for it uh, and say, yeah, I'd like that. But as soon as I'd use the word sanctify, it many times turned people off. They well, I know about that, and I've heard about it, and uh, it's impossible in all kinds of reasons. It's turned them off. And uh, so I didn't use the word. At least very rarely did I ever use the word. And uh, But tonight, I just want to use the word. <laughs> I don't think I'll turn you off. For one reason, although you've heard sermons on it and many and I have preached on it, I want you to know we've never yet reached the bottom of it. We've never yet reached the bottom of this word. And I don't think we ever will. As long as we live, no preacher and none of us will ever reach the bottom of this little word sanctified. So I want to look at it just a little bit. Uh, first, I want to call your attention to this, that there are two kinds of Christians in the world. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 18, he says, If the righteous scarcely be saved, that's 4, 18, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Now, he tells us here that the righteous, there are those that will be just barely saved. Saved by, the, as they said, the skin of their teeth. They'll get in by the grace of God. Now, I believe there will be people who will get to heaven that way just simply by the grace of God and no other reason. But I don't want us to use that scripture for us. That scripture is not for you to say, well, we'll just scarcely be saved. That isn't so for you. Is that all right? <laughs> so don't you use it. And don't you hide behind it. The scripture that I want you to use is Peter, the great apostle, in the second Peter. He goes on and tells us a little something more about this thing. In the first Peter, he tells us the righteous, if they're scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner? But in the second Peter, the first chapter, he's talking about the Christians and those of faith. And he said in the first chapter, the fifth verse, he says, but add to your, beside this giving diligence, to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if, you'd be, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from the, his old sins Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord. This is where we ought to set our sights to enter in, not scarcely get in, but to enter abundantly. If you'll add to your faith, virtue and all these, if you'll add to what God has given you, then you can have an entrance which is an abundant entrance into everlasting life. That's what God wants us to go after, the abundant entrance. Now... The doctrine of sanctification, I want to say this, is not a strange doctrine. Uh, the only place uh, that there's controversy is not about it, but uh, the controversy is how you get it. Now, that's where the controversy in the Christian world is. Theologians 
are all in agreement uh, that there is such a thing as inbred sin and that it's needed and there is sanctification, but as to how you get it and when you get it, that's when they differ. John Wesley said that every church up until the 18th century of the 1800s taught that inbred, taught inbred sin. And when you get saved, there is still that tendency within you to want to do wrong. Now, some say, I'm talking about different experiences of different, what different people believe. Some people believe that there is a second experience to get rid of this tendency. And some people say that it starts at salvation and is progressive the rest of your life, but it starts right with salvation. Sanctification starts there and is progressive the rest of your life. Then there are others who teach it's a crisis experience and then it's progressive. So you have all different uh, explanations of this. And from the Old Testament, it seems like uh, the Jordan and Israel crossed Jordan. That was a crisis experience, but the rest of their life, they were spent conquering Canaan. Now, some use this as a type, and if that's the case, it looks like there was a crisis experience, but then it's progressive the rest of their life. Whatever it is, I'm not a stickler uh, for the method. Now, I want you to know that now. I'm not a sticker to say, do this, 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 and you'll get sanctified. I don't have any such plan. I don't have any method. I don't have any way like that. Uh, so don't ask me. There, I am not a sticker for the method. All I'm interested in is that you get it. And however you get it is wonderful with me. I don't care how you get it as long as you get it. Now, that makes me think, and I've... Uh, uh, I think of Brother Schultz. You've heard him tell of how when he got converted, uh, he was so dissatisfied with himself. He prayed and said, God, if you can't do any more than forgive me, then I'd rather die than live. And uh, if you remember his story, he, he hemorrhaged at the lungs and thought from tuberculosis, was taken to a sanitarium, and he thought he was dying. And he said, thank you, Lord, because he thought God couldn't do any more than forgive him. So he was, uh, thank, he was happy God was going to take him to heaven. But in there was an old man that would come and talk scriptures with him. And finally, Reimer said to him, uh, you've got something I don't have. What is it? And the old man said to Reimer, well, if I tell you, you'll think I've indoctrinated you, so I'm not going to tell you. But you can find it in Romans, the fifth, from fifth chapter to the eighth chapter. So Reimer would go to the chapel every morning and take one verse at a time, inside and out, until finally at the end of three months he found an experience that he was looking for. Now, as I said, I'm not a stickler. Some people say, and I think John Wesley said, that he never met a man. It's possible to get it all at once, he said, but he never met a man who did. But I want to tell you, I believe I've met people who did. I believe I've met people who got it all at once. I, uh, I think of Brother Wadham that I've talked with you about in Canada, this dear man that was so ungodly and mean and yet uh, got saved with, uh, as he said it, with a belly full of rye and a big cigar in his mouth and just simply said, God, if you can do anything with me, will you do it? And God swept him into the kingdom and he, to me, got sanctified, saved and sanctified right away. God swept him into the kingdom and gave him everything that it seems like we're struggling for and trying to get. He got it with a big cigar in his mouth and drunk. Now, you explain that. That doesn't fit into my theology. And if it doesn't fit into yours, it's all right. I can't fit it into mine. I just know the man. I knew him, was with him many, many times in his home and churches. And I just know that he had it. That's all I know. And he had it. I want to tell you, he was a fighter, and God took all the fight out of him. He was mean. God took the meanness out of him. He loved everybody, and he just quit his drinking and smoking. He didn't. Nobody told him not to. He made him sick. He couldn't do it anymore. And he didn't. I told you, I mentioned before. He didn't even know what he had. It was so marvelous the change. But it was all suddenly, all at once. He didn't know it. He didn't know anything about it. But all I know is God did it. And I don't think that experience will fit into any church theology anywhere in the world that I know of. But God did it. That's good enough for me. I think of dear brother Khan that I've told you about as 
an older preacher, God, a dear great saint of God, that his boy came to him one day. And I think I've shared this experience, but I'll go over it again. fits in here. His boy came to him one day and said, Dad, I, I'm, I don't ever intend to get saved. Do I have to keep coming to church? And his dad said, well, son, if you don't intend to get saved, you don't need to come. He thought coming, he'd harden his heart. And uh, that would be worse than if he stayed away. So he said, son, you don't need to come anymore. And he went out into sin, lived in sin for a long time. And uh, But one day he got sick. And he thought, well, I'll take a little time off and go to California and see my, visit my brother. But on his way to California, a snowstorm drove him south. And he got into Texas where his old father was an evangelist. And he thought, I believe I'll go hear Dad preach again. Haven't heard him preach in years. So when he got in the meeting, he realized what his trouble was. He was under conviction. And when the altar call was given, he went down to the altar and got down there, and the people came and prayed to him. He said, Brother, take it by faith. And the old brother went down and said, Now, this is my son, and uh, I'll take care of him. So he said, Son, you've got business to do with God, so stick with it until you get through. Just stick with it. And that boy stayed there three days and three nights. Never heard of anybody else ever doing it. His dad all the time says, son, stick with it. I wonder how many dads would have said that. He says, son, stick with it. You're going to make it. Don't quit. Stick with it. And at the end of the third night, he came up out of there with one of these old-fashioned shouting experiences going all around that church, shouting and shaking hands with everybody in the place. And his dad said, now, folks, I want you to listen to my son, and this is not like him at all. He's normally quiet, and but I, and I tell you, that man, and he told me sometimes. He said, "I I believe." He said, "I don't know of anything else I can get." He said, "I believe I got it all once, and I believe he did." But I tell you, if you were with him, you couldn't be with him. Oh boy, he loved to talk about Jesus, and tears would come in his eyes. And I want to tell you, that man loved the Lord. I don't know what I couldn't have prayed with him to get anything else. He had more than most people had then that I knew anything about. And I believe he got it all at once. So I, I don't have a method, and I don't believe God has a method. I think he'll meet a man. Uh, makes me think of Uncle Bud Robinson. He said he tried to get sanctified, and it took him four years to get sanctified. But he said, if I'd have done the first night what I did the last, I'd have been sanctified four years before. He said it took him four years to surrender up everything. He'd surrender up a little bit and then a little bit more, and he'd think, well, I got it, and he'd find he didn't have it. He'd go surrender a little bit more, and he kept on for four years until he got everything surrendered, and then he got it. And he said, if I'd have done it the first night, I'd have got it then. So God doesn't have a pattern. You can't say, I can't say, stay at an altar three days and three nights. I can't say struggle for four years. I can't tell you anything. All I know is that God knows, and he knows how to meet our need and what to do with this. And... Um, so I'm trusting you've got to help us. Well, every church has had some way of dealing with this situation within us, this tendency to do wrong. I think of the Catholic Church, uh, the way they deal with this, they have the doctrine of purgatory. You see, the Catholic Church does not believe that any man anywhere in the world is good enough to get to heaven. That holy, righteous place, he's not good enough to get there unless he goes through some kind of purification. Well, they're not too wrong in their reasoning on that. So they believe, and though they, they teach the doctrine of purgatory, which that every man, even the Pope himself, has got to pass through purgatory for a period of the fires of purgatory to purify him in order to enable him to get to heaven. They said, no man can enter heaven the way he is. Well, that's a pretty good acknowledgement that there's something drastically wrong with human nature. That's really what the doctrine of purgatory is about. I talked with a Catholic one day, and I said to him, doesn't this doctrine of purgatory uh, kind of trouble you that uh, you have to go through uh, this uh, fires or whatever this is of purging? And, oh, no, he said, that's a great comfort to my heart because he said I could never make it without it. And he knew that this, that regardless of how he lived with all the shortcomings, with all the the sins that he may commit, he knew that there was that there was a place 
that God would take him through to cleanse him. And if it meant purgatory, he was glad because he said, it's a ray of hope to me. And so he was thankful for that doctrine. Well, Martin Luther came along and taught the just shall live by faith. In it he thought, therefore, that purgatory is not necessary, but the just shall live by faith. And the Lutheran church now, and that is unless they've changed their teaching, one of their scholars, I think, has put it this way, that since the fall of Adam, all men are born with a depraved nature and sinful propensities. Jesus died for original sins as well as actual sins of men, and that he also sanctifies those who believe in him by sending them the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Now that's from the Lutheran Church. And John Wesley taught sanctification, and one of the writers of the Methodist Church put it this way, what is entire sanctification? He said it is the state of being entirely cleansed from sin so as to love God with all our hearts and minds and soul and strength and our neighbors ourselves. So entire sanctification was to be cleansed and have a perfect love toward God and our neighbors. Well, that's a pretty good definition for it. I have no argument with that one. I want to turn and read a a voice, I mean a voice, (laughs) uh, in the wilderness to start to say, which would be all right. Uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And the 14th verse, the writer of Hebrews says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, uh, Brother Oliver, I, I believe probably has preached on this. I know he told me one time that at least when that American Standard Version came out, that it was the closest to the Greek that there was. Now, they've come out different versions since, which may be better, but at that time, that was the closest to the Greek that, that he knew. And But the, the American Standard Version says, pursue peace and sanctification, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, notice this, pursue sanctification. Now, he said that was the, close, the closest thing to the real Greek meaning of that word, pursue it. The dictionary says to pursue means to follow with the view to overtake. When you pursue something, it means you're after it and you're going after it until you overtake it. So pursue sanctification with the idea that, brother, you're going after it and you're going to keep after it until you overtake it. I like that. Now, however God wants to, however long it takes or how... Uh, whatever route he takes you down, uh, that's all right with me, just as long as you keep pursuing it until you overtake it. So to pursue means that you're going after something and you're going to keep at it until you overtake it. So this means for us to follow sanctification until you overtake it. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Somebody asked George Watson, so what do you, how do you explain that verse? Well, some of these verses are a little difficult to deal with, and George Watson, an old Methodist preacher, he explained it by saying, if you go to England, you get a passport to go to England. Why? He said, you can see the British Empire. You can go all over, see all different kinds, but he said, you won't get to see the king or queen on, on the passport. Now, he said the same thing is true in the gospel. Jesus said to Nicodemus, she must be born again to see the kingdom. But here, he said, you must pursue sanctification to see the king. Now, if you ever got in to see the king or queen of England, I want to tell you, uh, if you just went to England, you may come back and show your pictures of England, but if you ever got to see the king or queen, uh, they'd probably come out with the television and take a picture of you and interview you, and you'd be able to tell everybody, I tell you, you'd be excited about seeing, I tell you, I got to see the king and the queen, and you'd probably tell everybody, be excited. This is what happens to different ones in the church that are so happy, so excited, they've seen the king, and people can't understand what's the matter with them. (laughs) They've seen the king. They've got a right to get excited. And there are others that just have a passport to the kingdom. Now, I don't know what John, I mean, uh, George Watson may be right. I think of Israel when they came into the land of Canaan. God said, I'm going to give you the land. But they had to pursue it until they got it. 
Now, I look a little bit upon sanctification the same way. God says, I'll give it to you, but you're going to have to pursue it until you get it. And they got only what they pursued. That's all they got in Canaan. They got only, God gave it all to them, but they got only what they pursued. And I have a feeling that's the way it is with us in the sanctified life. Now, here's another thing I want you to notice. Many things are promised. God promises us many things, but we do not get them because we do not pursue them. Just because God promised them does not mean we'll get them. At Pentecost, there were 120 in the upper room. And it says that Jesus appeared to over 500 at once, so evidently only 120 pursued it. The others knew about it. And I believe every one of those 500 would have been happy to have had it. They might have even gone home and talked about it. But only 120 got it because they pursued it. I think of Gideon's army. Uh, in the book of Judges, God had 32,000, and they were Israelites. They weren't foreigners. They were Israelites. 32,000 were Israelites. But God said to, uh, to uh, Gideon, I can't use them because they're fearful and frightened. So let them tell them to go home. And then you remember, he said, well, I still can't use these because too many. They'll say if they won the victory, they'll say they did it. So God said, bring them down to the river, and I'll try them there for you. And... Uh, they went down. I want you to notice God, to God told them to take a drink. They didn't say, they didn't slip off and take a drink. And they didn't sneak out and get one. God told them to take the drink. But God said, I'm going to show you, get in the ones that I can use, the ones that will stick with us. When the thing gets hot and heavy, I'm going to show you the ones that will stick with us. And he said, those that lap the water in their hands like a dog. Uh, he said, they'll be the ones. Now, all 9,700 of them, God told them to take a drink, and they had every reason to do it, and they'd say, well, God told me to do it and gave them freedom to do it, but only 300 were really careful on how they took the drink. Although God told them. So I want you to see this. God told them in the 300. Now God said, these are the ones that I can use because they are, they're going to stick with you when the battle is hot and heavy. They're going to, they won't stop for a drink of water unless the battle's won. They'll stick with you. And I'll take them and use them. Isn't that something? God couldn't use, there's, uh, almost 32,000 of them. He couldn't use, uh, uh, 30, what would it be, 31,900 or 700. They were all Israelites. But he, he couldn't use them. Why? They wouldn't stick with him. When the battle got hot and heavy, they wouldn't keep pursuing. It says of Gideon and those 300, brother, when they were pursuing after the enemy, their one verse says they were faint but still pursuing. Boy, they didn't stop all of them. God knew they'd, they'll stick with you, Gideon. These are the guys, you take them. They'll stick with you when the battle gets hot. They're not going to quit. They're the ones I can use, and they won't take the credit for the victory. Think of that. Those that will take credit for the victory, he said, I can't use them either. But these 300... They're going to stick with you when the battle gets hot and they things get faint. They'll still be pursuing right with you until the end. They're not going to quit. Get in. These are the ones. And I'll give you the victory with these. See, God was going to give them the victory. Oh, what a wonderful God we serve. So God can't use the ones that will quit when the battle gets hot. Uh, he can't use those that think that they've won the battle. If you think you've won a battle, I want you to tell you, you've missed it. If there's any battle you've ever been in and it has been won, I want you to know you didn't win it. Can I say that again? Amen. Any battle that you're in and that it says it's been won, I want you to know you didn't win it. And if you think you did win it, you're going to miss out on the next battle. If you know Jesus won it, he gave me the battle. It's his victory. He'll help you the next time. 
And these are the ones. They'll not quit. They'll keep pursuing. And so the sanctified life are those that pursue this promise of God. And God has his own ways and his own times of bringing it about. But keep pursuing it with the idea of take, overtaking it until you get it. Don't quit. And I believe God will give it to those who won't quit, but will keep after it until you get it.